Smart Alex Show podcast. Smart Alex Show, baby! All right, all right, all right. What up, party people? How we doing? Uh, thank you guys for tuning in to episode number 15 of the Smart Alex Show podcast. Today, recorded an episode with the legendary sports journalist, Cedric Golden, who reports for the Austin American Statesman. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Cedric through my internship with UT Athletics in the PR and Communications Department. Uh, met Cedric in passing through uh, the press conferences and media availabilities that I help out with for the UT football team. So Cedric is an awesome dude. This conversation is about 45 minutes long, super great insight and wisdom in terms of, you know, how to find your calling, the benefits to finding a calling and something you're passionate about and enjoy doing, how putting in that work on the front end uh, to find that and work in that and break into that space is worth it on the back end for uh, how much you're going to enjoy your life so much more off of that, um, how playing the long game is important. He shares a lot of insight into how he became a great sports journalist with that path to getting there looks like some of his favorite stories that he's covered and favorite moments from his career and uh also very relevant for the times uh we talk about Bijan Robinson what makes him so special as not only a player but a person the future for him the predictions we have for the rest of the 2022 UT Longhorns football season uh the current state of the culture and program under coach Sark for UT and where the program is headed with Arch Manning, you know, apparently coming to Texas early in maybe January 23, the future for him and Quinn Ewers. And uh, also dive into a preview of Sam Ellinger getting his first start in Indy this coming Sunday. Um, he's getting his first start and Cedric is actually flying out to Indianapolis as we speak to go write a story on Sam Ellinger and his family and the way that they have persevered through a lot of the tragedy um, in uh, the recent year and a lot more. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you haven't already, drop a like, subscribe, leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. That helps us out tremendously to be able to be able, excuse me, to create more content, and bring more value to you guys. Thank you so much. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great honor today that I bring you this podcast conversation with an absolute Texas legend. He hails from the piney woods of East Texas, studied journalism at the University of Texas at Tyler before bringing his talents down to Central Texas to write for the Austin American Statesman, an iconic sports columnist adorned by people all over the United States, specifically Texas and especially the people of Austin. He's covered some of the greatest sports stories, including the UT Longhorns infamous 05 national title run and victory over Southern California, led by perhaps the greatest college football player of all time, Vince Young. He's covered Final Fours, World Series, the biggest prize fights in Vegas, and so much more. Also an avid podcaster himself, serving as the electric host of On Second Thought, Longhorn Confidential, Longhorn Unfiltered, and more. A consummate professional with questions that cut to the core, coverage that's unparalleled, and writing ability that is of the most exquisite caliber, unparalleled by none. Ladies and gentlemen, with great honor, the Cedric Golden. What's up, my man? Wow. I don't know if I could. Man, that's the greatest introduction I've ever received, Alec. And I'm like, wow, he's he's going down the whole list. And I don't I don't know if I can live up, live up to that intro. I'm going to try, bro. <laughs> hey, man, you live up to it every day. Every press conference, every media availability that I'm working and you're asking Coach Sark and Bijan and Quinn and the players questions, I see it with the with the questions, you know, digging deep into the psychology, the philosophy of it all. So I'm a big fan, man, but uh, I appreciate you taking time to be here, man. Let's do it. It's my pleasure. Yeah, so I'm curious. So what inspired you to become 
a journalist, a sports journalist? And how early on in your life did you know this is the route you wanted to go? Man, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, well, first of all, I, I grew up, uh, like you said, I grew up in East Texas and Tyler. I grew up as a big baseball fan, big MLB guy. And so uh, what I would do is I would get the daily newspaper. I watched the Cincinnati Reds. They were my team. Uh, Pete Rose was my favorite player. My dad would go, you see how that guy, when he draws a walk, he runs to first base. He doesn't walk. He's a hustle. He hustles. And so the scoreboard page was my Bible. And I'd go and find how the Reds did the night before and see how Pete Rose did or Joe Murray and George Foster, Concepcion, those guys. And this was back at a time, and Alec, you're very young. This is back at a time where uh, the daily newspaper was was your sports, your number one uh, sports information. Um, it, it, it was your source. And um, the coolest guys, I thought, were the guys – that did the sports report from 1025 to 1030. This is before Sports Center. There wasn't an ESPN. There wasn't a 24 hour sports cycle. We had the daily newspaper and we had the sports at 1025 to 1030. And during football season, we got the halftime highlights on Monday Night Football. That's how we saw the other teams did. Uh, but so I, I, I would, I would pour that scoreboard page, and then uh, um. It came a time around 11 or 12, I started jotting down little notes, start uh, trying to write my own little stories and compare them to what I was reading in the paper. And my dad would always go, oh, it needs work. It needs work. What do you think about this one, dad? It needs work. And so the writing bug always got me. I thought I might be one of those guys uh, that come on at 1025 to do the sports, the Roger Wallace types, uh, because I like wearing suits. But it it was something that uh, I, I had broadcast in me, but I was better at writing, and that writing bug never went away. Got a job at the Tyler Morning Telegraph after college. Um, thought I died and went to heaven. My first year, I, I got hired there that summer of '93, and uh, in Jan the following January, I found myself covering the Super Bowl, the Cowboys and the Bills. My boss had an extra credential. And within six months, I'm covering a Super Bowl and I'm at them, I'm hitting these Super Bowl buffets for free and they had media gifts. And I met Mike Tirico and Stephen A. Smith. I met, I met guys in my age group that, you know, they went on to, to great things as well. And uh, I, I left Atlanta and came back home. My dad goes, how did, how did you enjoy it? I go, this is what I want to do, man. This is it. I'm never going to play in the Super Bowl, but if I can cover <laughs> one. And so the thing is, I, I've gotten to be around these great events and document them and and give my own little spin on what happened. And it's just been a really rewarding experience over these last uh, nearly 30 years. That's incredible, man. So how, how old were you when you covered that first Super Bowl, man? Because it seems like you jumped in pretty quickly. I know, man. I was, I want to say I was 27. 27 yeah so what did it feel like to be early in your career cowboys bills like i mean that's incredible and meeting dudes like mike Tarico and stephen a smith and i know you brought mike on your podcast since then but like what has that what was that like you know meeting those guys back in the day it was strange it was strange and those guys were like me and they were you know they were like me they were young and they were getting started in the business and Tarico just started at ESPN, and I think Stephen was uh, at the Philadelphia Inquirer, if I'm not mistaken. And and so you you just saw a lot of these different these different people trying to find their way in the business, and then it's all on the at the in the back with the backdrop of the Super Bowl uh, playing. And and I'm like, wow, this is what it's like to do this. And you know. Um, I ended up, I'm, I'm a covering high schools at the time. So I go from covering high schools to covering the biggest sporting event in the world in my first six to seven months in the, in the game. And all of a sudden I'm like, this is my calling. This is my calling. And my boss, Phil Hicks, uh, who's still the sports editor at the Tyler Morning Telegraph, uh, gave me my start in the business forever grateful. 
took me to the underground, which is a group of restaurants uh, in Atlanta downtown. And I, I, I walk around and I see something I hadn't seen. Alec. Like I see people of color in suits and with briefcases and shirts and ties and they're business people. And I'm from East Texas. I didn't see a lot of black people uh, working white collar jobs. And I was like, well, either I'm going to do this for a living or I'm going to move to Atlanta or both. One of those is going to happen. So uh, I got the I got the real fortunate opportunity to get a job that that pays me pretty well and to do something I love. And isn't that what life's supposed to be about? Absolutely, man. No, that's uh, that's very inspiring. And, and, you know, you hit on a lot of great points there. I mean, it's it's so empowering to see like people like yourself and then me using this platform. That's also what I'm trying to do is like, you know, people of color showcasing us doing different things than, you know, maybe in generations past, we've been stereotyped to think that we only do, you know. Um, and it's just so, so cool to see how you've able to, you've been able to carve out this space for yourself, you know, not just working a job, but doing something that is a calling to you. And you can, you know, provide yourself a better life through that. You know, you're having fun doing what you love and providing value to people's everyday lives and at the same time able to make a living. So it's very cool to see, man. Um, I recently read uh, Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, a founder of Nike. And one of the points he made later in the book that stuck with me is like, don't just find a job. Don't just find something that you're kind of passionate about, but, you know, find a calling. And then through that, you know, the sky's the limit because you actually enjoy it, man. So it's cool to see people like yourself, you know, carving out that path for others to follow in, man. So we appreciate it. I need to tell you, man, I'm, I talk to young people all the time and and I always tell them, um, you know, you, you've heard the saying you know, life is short. It's not. Life is long. And you're going to be here if if you're blessed. Most of us going to be here at three score and 10. So 70 plus years. So if you're 20 years old or 19, don't settle for a job because of money or because of convenience. Find a job you love. Find a job that when you wake up in the morning that you're excited, that you're excited to go do that job. Find something that, that you can get paid at, that, that makes you laugh, that keeps you happy and do that job to the best of your ability and make sure it's legal, of course. But I'm telling you, make sure you have a something that makes you happy outside of your social life. If you find a job that you get paid at and you love it and you make pretty good money and it doesn't feel like a job, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And that's a life calling. And that makes life a lot more fun. I, I've got friends that make more money than me, Alec. And I, and I know that half of them are not happy with their jobs. They're making good money, but they're like, man, I don't want, I just hate this job. I gotta find, I'm like, man, find something that's more um, satisfying and gratifying to you and, and then go do it. So that's what I always tell people. Uh, I'm one of the, I'm one of the few people that actually wanted to be something growing up and became that. Absolutely. Um, uh, well, you know, besides being in the NFL or NBA, but, <laughs> you know, everybody wants to do that. So everybody, yeah, man, no, there's a job, job. Yeah, this is it. Powerful wisdom there, man. And, you know, you mentioned Stephen A. Smith earlier, and I believe uh, last year he made a good point. He said, LeBron James is the American fantasy. I am the actual American dream. You know, I dreamt of going to the NBA, but I couldn't make it there. But I became, I grinded for years as a columnist, as a journalist, and now I'm in the broadcasting game. And I've, I've been able to, you know, strike million dollar deals with, you know, networks like ESPN. So he's like, I'm more of the, um, you know, the American dream as opposed to the athlete, the pro athlete at the highest level being the American fantasy. So I think that's a good point you make, man. Like, you know, if you can't make it to the league and that's your dream, you can still find a way to be involved in your dream and your passion in other ways, you know, whether that be the coaching route or the media route or, you know, the business side of it and marketing or, you know, programming, whatever the case may be, there's there's ways that you could still tap into your childhood dream, you know what I mean? But uh, that's powerful wisdom, man. And, and the other thing too that comes to mind is like, you know, you mentioned the money aspect of it. Like, yeah, there's, um, there's other people making more money, but I feel like we, we're getting to a point in society where it's like you gotta measure things 
uh, outside of just money and financial terms, right? Like there's intangible things that come with a job, right? Like yourself, you know, you've got almost 20,000 followers on Twitter. You've got influence. You're able to hang out with the athletes and do, do something you love. So I think there's something intangible there when it comes to like the ability to command influence from your word. You know, you could tweet something out or, or the ability to command sponsorship dollars from a, a podcast following, you know. So I feel like we're entering this new media realm where it's like you can judge things off of more than just, you know, your salary. You know what I mean? And uh, I think that's the important part. And like you said, life life is short and we should enjoy it in the moment. But at the same time, it's long, man. You know, and if you're just 19 or 20, you might as well, like, put the work in on the front end to find something you enjoy so that on the back end for so many years, you can be doing something you enjoy, make a living off it and become a master at it. You know, whether that be podcasting or writing or whatever the case may be. And I was like in a similar situation uh, just last year, man, I was working at AT AT&T in Dallas doing B2B sales. And to be frank, man, you know, I respect it. I respect the people who do that. But for me, it wasn't my calling. I absolutely hated it. And that's what led me to come back down to Austin and say, you know what? I don't care about if I'm going to make less money or quite frankly, if I'm going to eat shit for a couple of years, I want to do what I want to do. And I want to be in the sports game and the sports media game. And uh, now I work with a marketing agency that works across sports and entertainment and I'm making less money. Yeah. But I'm wake up every day knowing that I'm learning about the field that I enjoy. And then I'm going to work at UT meeting people like yourself working in sports media. So that to me is way more worth it than, you know, just settling for the paycheck, especially in your early twenties. You know what I mean? You, you're playing the long game. Absolutely. And the long game is going to be more beneficial than settling uh, for more money at a job that, that you don't see yourself, see it being viable long-term. Uh, and so you've kind of recognized that early in the process. And instead of uh, talking about making a change, you went ahead and made that change. And what that's going to do uh, is that's going to prove uh, beneficial and it's going to provide you dividends uh, later on in life. And you're putting in the work right now. You're making the contacts. You're uh, you're in a you're in, you're working with two reputable companies and what's going to happen is seven or eight years down the line, you're going to be like, man, I am so glad I, I made that move. And you went out on faith and sometimes you got to have a little bit of faith to do that. You're not going to grow if you don't take chances and you took a chance. Absolutely, man. Uh, taking chances, man. It's uh it's an important part of life and it's a little scary sometimes, but I feel like that's what makes it worth it. You know, it'd be kind of boring if we knew how it was all going to play out and we knew it was always going to work out. So yeah, man, no, this is powerful stuff. I appreciate the insight here, but I'm curious, you know, for, for people who are early in their careers and realize they want to be a sports journalist, you know, they want to be a Cedric Golden, you know, how do they get there, man? What's the journey like? You hit those books, you hit them hard. Uh, I wasn't a great student. I was a, you know, had a scholarship to junior college and kind of played around too much. And then when it came time for me to pay for my own in those last couple, three years, it's amazing how when you when you take money out of your own pocket, how big a motivator that is. So um, I think that college is the best place to be if you don't know what you want to be. Sooner or later, it's going to occur to you, this is what I want to do. And what a great uh, proving ground that is uh, to be in school while you're making those decisions. Um, the, the one thing I would encourage people to do is whatever vocation you're in, do your research, do your homework, study the people you respect in that business and, and don't be afraid to reach out to them or people like them because they, they um, you'll be surprised at how many people want would would like to share their um their experience with you uh nothing makes me happier than than imparting a little bit of wisdom to young people who are trying to make it um i recently took a job teaching a journalism class at the university of texas and when i tell you it's a small class but i'm telling you these kids are are some of the smartest brightest uh uh just incredible minds that i've been around and they're young they're 20 they're 21 
their whole lives are ahead of them and they're they're enthusiastic about learning they're funny they're smart they're they're informed and they've taught me just as much if not more than i taught them so um i i i like mentoring and i and i enjoy the fact that there are people out there that are young who are not looking for the world to hand them something they're looking to go earn it and uh, people like yourself uh, you inspire old guys like me to keep going <laughs> Hey man, I, I appreciate that. But you're you're still young, man. What you talking about? You young <laughs> buck out here, man. You're, I'm I'm yeah I'm young compared to my colleague Kirk Bowles, but <laughs> but I look around those pressers and I don't see too many people older than me besides Kirk. So <laughs> yeah, your boss John Bianco is a little bit older than me, uh, but <laughs> not by much. So we are uh, we're we're all in our golden years, pun not intended. So. I, I I feel young, but man, there's some there's some rings on that carbon. There's a little some carbon <laughs> going on. Hey man, why why you got to do Kirk like that, man? <laughs> He's old. He <laughs> is old, and I'm try. I want to be like him when I grow up. So. Man, yeah, you know, he's, he's up there and he's and he doesn't show any signs of slowing down doesn't show any he's signs of slowing down and he's got those fresh nike kicks on you know he's he's young in spirit man you know as the saying goes black don't crack man so you're still looking good we're still oh, making man. But, Try uh, it. Try you know what's it. So cool about mentoring people and teaching is like you said it's kind of ironic and paradoxical in the sense that you almost learn as much from mentoring and teaching as the kids that you're teaching, right? Like in, you know, talking Absolutely. about the subject matter, you're really testing yourself to see how much you know and how much you can articulate back to the people you're teaching. And I always find it interesting how, when I think I know about a topic, I get humbled very quickly when someone asks me about it and I'm now tasked with breaking it down in a digestible and simple manner for them to understand. I'm like, oh shit, maybe I don't know as much about that as I thought because I'm having mm. a hard time explaining it. So it's pretty cool to see, man. What do, what do you, uh, so what's your class like? What do you teach about? It's called uh, uh, Sports, Media, and Society. And what it is, it's a concept class and it's about, it's about the areas that intersect with sports and media, uh, entertainment, uh, gender and sexuality, politics, uh, institutional racism, uh, Title IX issues, um, stuff like that, uh, covering covering uh, transcendent athletes, uh, historical figures, and so what we do in that class is we bring in we bring in an uh, esteemed guest to talk about their experiences um, that you know that relate to the uh, discussion at hand, and then and then we discuss it and 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 we go around the room because it's a really interesting perspective to hear what young people have to say about events that happened long before uh, they were born. Uh, some, some of them before I was born, uh, we talked about institutional racism and, and uh, transcendent black athletes and Jess, Jesse Owens was one and um, sports intersecting with politics, uh, no bigger example than the 1936 Berlin Olympics where Adolf Hitler uh, had proclaimed that the Aryan race was superior to all races in the world and that black that black people were inferior to his Germans, his pure blood Germans. And then Jesse Owens goes into Berlin in the very first uh, globally televised Olympics. And he wins four gold medals with Hitler sitting uh, in the arena. And there's nothing the, the Fuhrer could do about it. And it dispelled that Aryan superiority uh, uh, concept. Um, a black American man kicked, kicked Adolf Hitler's butt. And, and so, we talked about we talk about those kind of issues, transcendent moments, the 1980 Miracle on Ice, uh, hockey, U.S. winning the gold medal, those kind of things, and and what what comes out of it are really good discussions and great um, uh, great ideas moving forward. And they write about it. They they do group presentations. It's a really fun class, and it's the first class I've ever taught, and so. Uh, these kids have taught me just as much as I've taught them, and we've had a real blast doing this class. That's incredible, man. And uh, imagine, I can't imagine the weight that was on Jesse Owens' shoulders to know that, you know, what he was about to do was potentially going to have more influence in a sense 
in a psychological and cultural sense for years to come than the actual things going on in the war itself. You know what I mean? Like him. Well, listen to this, but he goes in over there and wins it. Wins four gold medals, and then he comes back to an America that doesn't respect him because he's black. Just so, great. So he's a hero. Absolutely. And 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 all these people are promising him endorsements when he won all that gold. But you got to remember, it's in the middle of the Great Depression. He comes back to a poor America, pre World War II, and the opportunities that he thought he was going to get, he didn't get them. So he ends up working at a gas station. Pumping gas of, of, of an Olympic gold medalist who just did it in front of the world, probably besides Joe Lewis, the most recognizable uh, face in American sports, and he's pumping gas. Yeah. It's so, crazy. interesting, Man. interesting study. It's crazy to think, but your, your class sounds fascinating because, like, you know, a lot of times people forget how sports is so tied into the culture. And there's so many intersections with politics within sport. And uh, it's it's cool that you cover those complex topics and those deep topics that aren't easy to discuss among different backgrounds of people. You know what I mean? I might have to enroll next semester, man. You might see me walk up in there. Uh, um, probably next fall. I'm uh, I'm teaching uh, reporting sports. Ah, very cool, man. Uh, next, might, next might spring. But uh, yeah, no, very fascinating, bro. Very fascinating indeed. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, moving on here, what, what do you think the biggest keys are to leading a successful career as a sports journalist and being the best sports journalist one can be? Preparation, um, patience. Uh, I know a lot, a lot of young people now think that they, they're going to graduate from college and go and move, move to Bristol and start uh, be on sports center two weeks later. That happens that way. Sometimes you got to start out at a small gig and you got to work your way up. That's what I did. And uh, patience, uh, humility. I think if you, you got to treat people like you want to be treated. You can't, you can't go through life being, being a, a, an ass to people and think, and think that you're going to get rewarded. Um, I believe that, that uh, respect for one's uh, fellow man is very important. And uh, if, if you show yourself uh, respectful, then maybe one day you will be respected. And, and so I've, I've always carried myself that way. I respect the people that came before me, uh, people like Kirk Bowles and um, that, that have done this a long time. And so um, when, when, you, when, you're humi- when, you, when you have a degree of humility, you're prepared for the job at hand, and and you're respectful to the people that you're around, then I really think that good things can happen for you in this business. Absolutely, man. No, those are those are important, important values to uphold, man. And I love how you said, you know, like patience, right? You're not gonna, you know, get graduate college and first day out, you know, you're hosting Sports Center or Scott Van Pelt. Doesn't happen. Steak with Stephen A. You know, there's a lot of years where you're dream will be tested you know like you'll really question do i really want to do this you know and that's what uh persevering that journey is what it's all about but um i'm curious is there any tips you have when it comes to writing or asking questions or or even talking in a broadcast or stuff like that be ready be prepared prepared don't show don't show up to an interview with a blank slate have 10 questions ready for the person you're going to interview do your homework on that person. Don't come up, like if you're interviewing me, don't come up to me and go, so where were you born? Where were you born, Cedric? Man, mm-hmm. look that up. It's on there. People know I'm from Tyler. Exactly. Uh, the better question is, how was it like growing up in Tyler? That lets an interview, that lets the subject know, oh, you've done your homework on me. You know I'm from Tyler. Mm-hmm. That puts people at ease. So preparation, um, knowledge of your subject is very important. Um, have fun. Yeah, have man. Fun. That's a crucial ingredient, right? Have that. fun. Do you ever see you? You're never gonna see me too serious. I, I, I'm gonna have fun at my job. And now the subject matter. If somebody dies, you're not gonna hear me. You're not gonna see me over there shucking and jiving. But, mm-hmm. but you know what? But, but for the most part, sports is supposed to be entertainment, and it's supposed to be fun. So That's make true. sure you have a good time doing it. 
And um, don't, don't be afraid to bounce ideas off your colleagues because more times than not, they may have a different perspective than you. Their perspective may be better than yours. Be fine with that and thank them for their perspective because no one, no one has all the answers. So uh, preparation, knowledge, respect, fun, and, 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 um, and open-mindedness when it comes to approaching your craft. Absolutely, man. And it goes back to the point you made earlier about humility, right? Like you got to be open-minded and ask your colleagues question because a lot of times their idea might be better than yours or they might have an adjustment or tinkering to your idea that improves it. Um, no, awesome insight there. So moving on, man, I'm, I'm curious, what have been the best moments of your career? Like what have been the best storylines that you've enjoyed covering? Man, so many. Uh, that, that first Super Bowl was were special. I mean, you know, you start there, and I'm like, man, I'll never, I may never cover another Super Bowl, but wasn't this great? <laughs> um, uh, one, one that I really enjoyed is um, there's a boxer named Ann Wolf. Mm -hmm. And Ann Wolf lives in Austin. And Ann Wolf, uh, at age 25, was homeless on the streets of Austin. She moved here from rural Louisiana, had two young daughters, and she's living on the streets in Austin. Uh, sneaking in the emergency rooms with her two daughters and and just you know, hoping that no one will bother her, trying to pretend to be a patient, you know. And so I met her in 2000 and I, I heard, I, and she gave me her story and she learned uh, this old guy named Pops Billingsley, who was a retired janitor from AISD, taught her how to box. This family in Waco became her sponsor, the Pardo family. And the next thing you know, Ann Wolf has won eight um, world championships. And she is a self-made woman. She um, has been on HBO's Real Sports many times. And uh, last uh, this earlier this year, she got inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. And two years ago, she had a role in the blockbuster movie, Wonder Woman. So uh, Ann Wolf is a true American success story. And uh, that she she's probably the most interesting person I've interviewed. I've written about a, a basketball league of grandmothers in Georgetown, where you got to be 55 or older to play in the league. And these old women are going around and they can play. Um, covered the testosterone festival in Austin just a bunch of dudes talking about fantasy football and cars and drinking beer. I did that. <laughs> uh, th I mean, those are some of the quirky ones, you know, the, anybody can say final fours or for sure, but those college are series, awesome. but it's the, it's the quirky weird stories that stand out the most. And so those are, those are some of the ones that I enjoy that I've enjoyed writing over the years. Yeah, very cool, man. And Ann Wolf, what a what a story, man. What an underdog story. Go to YouTube. It's all on YouTube. Read me. Read you can you can Google my name and Ann Wolf. You'll find it. Yeah. Good, and what a story she has. I love those stories, especially within the realm of boxing and MMA, because they're such tough sports, man. And you think of like uh a triple G where he came from or a Khabib or a McGregor who used to work as a plumber before, you know, becoming one of the biggest names within sports, definitely within UFC, but, uh, and Wolf, man, we'll definitely check that out. That is incredible to, you know, get it, go from where she was down here to being inducted into the boxing hall of fame, you know, this past year. So legend, incredible stuff. All up, um, when we get done, call up and Wolf Vonda Ward, V O N D A Ward. Ann Wolf fought Von Der Ward, and Ann Wolf's like 5'8", and Von Der Ward was like a 6'6 Amazon who had never lost, and and um, I'll just say one word, Tim Burr, uh, and chopped down that tree in the first round. You got one of the mo one of the most electrifying knockouts of all time, and it's got no, it's gotten millions of YouTube views. You'll see it. Unbelievable, man. That's almost a foot of difference. I can't, I don't even understand how <laughs> possible just on wingspan alone. You know what I mean? Oh, I know. Like that's, that's crazy, bro. I'm real, real quick. I'm curious. What was the testosterone festival? Like strange. Very strange. <laughs> when Very he's strange. 
was it like? Oh, uh, they invited me there, and I walk in, and I think it was at the Parmary Event Center downtown, and I walk in, and there's girls walking around in bikinis, and uh, there's our, there are a couple of sports cars uh, on display. We had a a celebrity fantasy league football draft that I was a part of, and and uh, I was like, man, what is this? What is this? <laughs> And I like it. It was strange, and uh, people really, people really enjoy reading it. But man, it was it was really strange. Uh, I told my I told my wife. I said I, I saw a lot of dudes. You know what I didn't see with those dudes? She goes, "What?" I go, "Women." <laughs> didn't see many women hanging out with these guys. Yeah, so There's it was strange. It was strange. You could play it to to the point where a woman, you know, you know, you gonna push them away. There's only so much. So at first, when I read on on your bio and doing my homework on you, when it said testosterone festival, I thought it meant something scientific, like the science no. of testosterone, or like dudes using THT to like you know combat aging or something like that. But it it literally just was like dudes being dudes, like beer, football, fantasy football, stuff like that. This dude stuff, cold beer flowing. Yeah. Yeah, very cool, yeah. man. Very cool. Real quick, because I know you got a busy weekend ahead going to cover Sam Ellinger and whatnot. Um, what makes Bijan Robinson so special, man? To me, it seems like he's he's such a transcendent player in the sense that like not only the NIL endorsements, and it was funny how you said, Hey, Bijan, you're a millionaire. You, you know, what are you doing here now the other day at the conference? But uh, what makes him so special, man? He seems like such a humble leader off the field and just an easy guy to get along with for anyone he's a, sweet, he's a sweet kid how do you not like it i mean he's such a sweet kid and he's as nice as you think he is and and when you when you ask other people about b john robinson his teammates his coaches they never talk about his ability they yeah. go oh my god he's a great person yeah he's a great person and his 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 physical gifts are undeniable he's a first round pick Mm -hmm. He's all, he's the best running back in college football, and he could start for half the NFL teams right now. He could, Absolutely. and so but they talk about his his humility, his grace, um, his general just a general sweet demeanor. He's he's a guy that every old man hopes his daughter brings home. Absolutely. Yeah, because he's he's just a nice person, and um, I like nice people. I pull for nice people. And even uh, win or lose, B. John Robinson's going to be there. And the one thing I remember last year, they lost to Kansas. B. John had hurt his elbow. And and um, right before that, he was out, you know. And so you knew he wasn't going to play, but he showed up at the Monday presser. And I'm going, what are you doing here? You're not playing this weekend. He goes, I know you guys have a job to do, and you probably wanted to talk to me. And I'm sitting there going, he's as cool as I think he is. And he is. And so... Uh, what what I enjoy about him is 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 the his passion for his craft and the way he treats people that goes a long way with me. I always I always think that character is revealed when the cameras aren't on. And anytime you see Bijan, when there aren't cameras on, he's he's just as nice as he is when those bright lights are in his face. Yeah, no, that's that's a great quote right there. Character is revealed when the cameras are off, man. And uh, you know, it's so crazy to think to be that caliber of a player and no matter who you talk to they don't talk about your ability on the field everyone always starts it with he's an incredible person and you know he's a good man see what i think about the football team right now it always it, it always comes back to that and i think that's players like Bijan really can set the culture for a program for years to come and do you think that that elevates his draft stock you know being that marketable as a player and that good of a leader no that's a meat market up there man it's if can you play? Yeah, that's that's a paramount thing. And that's all about what you're doing on the field. Uh, yeah. The other stuff, you know, will come the commercials and all the endorsements that'll come later. But you got to prove that you're you're a guy that can get it done on the field. Um, mm -hmm. The marketability thing is more of an, a college thing right now because you got guys walking around with NIL deals that aren't going to sniff the NFL. Yeah. But uh, then you got guys like Bijan that you know is going to play. Roshan Johnson, you know, is going to play in the league uh but it's all it, that is 99.99 about physical ability can you make plays at that level the marketability thing that's for an agent but for these owners that draft Bijan robinson they're drafting him to make 
plays. That's it. For sure, which he can do. And uh, speaking of Roshan, I mean, Texas with just the three-headed monster at running back with uh, those three guys. I mean, they're just incredible, man. Uh, real quick, before before we let you go, Cedric, um, predictions for the rest of UT season and predictions for the culture of the UT program for, for the next coming years, man. Arch is coming, you know, big, big players are coming in. You know, what do you think? Um, I had them at eight and four at the beginning of the season. I'm going to stick to that. Um, that. That's what they look like. I don't trust them on the road. Mm -hmm. um, they they still blow leads late on the road. I um, I think K-State, if uh, Adrian Martinez plays at quarterback, that's going to be a tough, that's going to be tough. Better teams than this one have gone to the Little Apple and gotten beat. Uh, TCU, I, I could see them beating TCU in Austin. Texas plays, plays well at home. So, um, I don't think they're going to be in the Big 12 championship game. I think they're probably going to finish third in the conference or fourth. Um, as far as the culture, Steve Sarkeesian's got to figure it out. Why are they blowing these leads? Uh, a case can be made that the Longhorns could be undefeated. They should have beat Alabama. The refs blew that. Uh, they, they were up double digits in, in Lubbock. They were up double digits in Stillwater. So those are the kind of things that he's going to have to figure out with his staff. Um, Arch Manning reportedly is coming in January. Uh, I don't talk a whole lot about recruits until they sign. Once Arch signs, I'll be all over Arch. But until he signs, he's, he's just a guy who says he's coming. So if he comes, he's the guy that can transcend of the sport. And um, I think Quinn Ewers is a very good quarterback. Once once he figure out figures out his deep, long field accuracy issues, I think he can be great. The question is, is he just going to be great for one more year? And then knowing that Arch is going to be here, is he going to leave? So uh, those are questions that we'll soon answer. If he if Quinn Ewers has a big time year next year, he can leave and go pro. That'll be three years of college. So. Uh, those are questions that have to be asked, but Sarkeesian's got to fix his quarterback. He's got to fix the defense, and he's got to fix that culture of blowing leads. Like I, when you were there on uh, last week, I said it was it was a perception, but now it's reality. You guys blow leads, and you don't want to eat that to eke into the psyche of a locker room of young men because they're smart enough to know, man, we can't hold a lead on the road, and that's a problem. I think it's, I mean, it's safe to say it probably already has leaked into the psyche, right? It's happened. Of course. How many dating of back course. So I, that's We're talking I'm, about it. They're thinking about it for sure. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, so where can we find you, Cedric? Where can we follow you on social, read your articles, listen to your podcast, man? You can find me on Twitter at said golden, Instagram at said golden, uh, Facebook. I'm easy to find. Uh, podcast on Second Thought with Kirk Bowles and myself is on statesman.com, hook'em.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, you name it, we're on there. And um, it drops every Thursday, usually around 10 or 11 in the morning. Uh, subscribe to it and it'll pop up in your inbox. We have a lot of laughs and we're very good guests. We uh, just completed our 278th and we're right. riding headlong to 300, baby. Yeah, congrats on 200. That's awesome. It'll be a minute until we get there on this platform, but we'll get there and we appreciate you being a part of it. Thank you so much for being here, man, and sharing the wisdom and having a great conversation, man. I really enjoyed it. Um, so you're heading to Indianapolis this weekend, right? Yeah, flying out uh, to see Sam Ellinger and his first career start, um, uh, fashioning up a big column, going to talk to his mom and his teammates and then, then attend the game on Sunday against the Washington Commanders. I think Sammy's going to lead them to a win, even though history isn't very kind. Since 1966, uh, Colts quarterbacks in their first start, 1-15. in 15. Nowhere to go but up. Unbelievable. 1-15. One in, one in no, Sam, Sam will lead them to a dub. What is it like seeing, you know, the quarterback, the electric quarterback in Sam Ellinger that you covered for years here in Austin, now going to Indianapolis to cover him and seeing all the stuff he's been through with his family, his father, his brother, like, What's what's that piece going to be like, man? What does it feel like for you? I think it's a redemption piece. I think he I think I think this is the dream. This is the culmination of all those hours of work and and coming to UT and having some ups and downs, having some tragedy early in life and losing his little brother a couple of years ago. And uh, it's going to be a story of redemption. 
Does it really matter if he wins or loses on Sunday? It doesn't. He's winning in life right now. And, um, you know, life's dealt him some tough cards. And he's, st- and he's still uh, striving. And he's still uh, uh, moving forward. So I look forward to seeing him after the game on Sunday. Absolutely, man. Well, thank you so much, Cedric. Safe travels, man. Go Colts. <laughs> All right, man. Hey, uh, pleasure, Alec. Thank you for having me, bro. What up, party people? Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Smart Alex Show podcast. I hope you guys gained at least half the value that I gained from my conversation with Cedric and enjoyed it as at least half as much as I did. Cedric, as you guys have seen, awesome dude, someone I really enjoy talking to all the time at the press conferences and all the UT football events. Um, Definitely feel free to subscribe to Cedric's stuff in the links down below. Subscribe to my stuff. That way you guys don't miss anything with regards to UT football uh, from Cedric or the other topics he covers or from myself with regards to the podcast or the stuff I've got going on. Um, As mentioned before, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate it. And uh, let's go Horns. Hook them, baby. Don't be such a smart alley.